thought they were ready? Or they no, because you thought they were in that situation. You thought they were a domestic violence. You, you thought they were in it. Well, I, I think that's a, that's a tough question because I believe there definitely can be. Because it depends, um, especially if the woman is actually being abused. No, no, if she's not. She, she's not. Right. But, 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 but you're offering her help. Because you think they are. Because, because you think she um, is, but she's not. Is there any danger in doing that? Well, see, that that's tough because that's a whole other situation. But um, I would physical danger, I would think not. Um, you might end up with a squatter. You know, <laughs> if there, is it somebody that comes to your house that you have to evict to get out? Okay. You know, <laughs> I mean, so and there's a lot of codependency stuff, you know, that, that can occur. I mean, I've, I've had a couple stalkers, you know, offering assistance. Um, so I, I've learned to kind of um, curtail. Uh, but so what I try to do is just, is just, um, you let them know that I'm available for advice. Okay. Um, so be very specific about your what you're willing to do. I mean, if it's a family member, then you will say, you know, you can come stay with me. You can, you know, those types of things. But just being very cautious about what it is that you are offering okay. in terms of assistance. Yes. Okay. So having grown up in a very violent and disruptive childhood, I developed the other approach. Where did you get the idea? that you were capable of doing that. Somebody around you had to show you that was possible, because that was a direct contradiction to everything you had grown up with. It what was that true. source? And you know what's interesting about that is that, and I have, I have dealt with this question, and I have tried to figure it out for myself. And, um, and honestly, I, I, where I grew up, I grew up in San Leandro, right outside of Oakland. And we were one of the first African-American families to move into that area. So all I ever saw were were people who did not look like me being successful. And, you know, being called the N-word, that I would never be anything. I mean, I had a teacher tell me that I need to decide whether I was going to be a maid, I forgot what the other one was. Nurse. Something ridiculous. This was a teacher. You know, most African Americans, or blacks, whatever you said at the time, um, might have called me a Negro, actually. Yeah, you probably Now that were. I think about it, I think I'm dating myself. Or I'm dating him. Um, I can't remember, but but whatever he said, it was really derogatory, and he and he asked me if I expected to be a maid or this that, and the other. And then I had, and I was we were the only black family in the school. And then I had a principal who every time I turned around was a, a, he was writing me up for something or putting me on um, detention. And in her mind, she was trying to help me because of the color of my skin. And the expectation was that I was going to go down the wrong path. And and, um, and we were also, my mother uh, was a very, she was extremely good at negotiation and, and we could not afford to go to that school, but she talked us into it, so we were not paying to be there. So this is her opinion of me. So for me, I believe, I like people that were putting me down. I never had people that were lifting me up. So where um, did you get the belief that you could do it? Because I was going to show them. Okay, That's so the reaction is, I'm going to be a maid, you watch yeah. me. Exactly. Yeah. You watch me, but I'm a clean house, but it's not going to be <laughs> that way. <laughs> you know, so, um, but you said your mother was a negotiator, so you saw her as something outside the world that was success oriented. I, I did, it's tough because I, I, I still have some challenges in my mind, um, but I, I did and I didn't because the way she used, she was a great negotiator, she was extremely articulate, but for example, we always had to have these beautiful Easter outfits. It was all a show. It was always everybody seeing how great we were. So she gets on the phone with Macy's, and she puts on an English accent to extend her credit limit. <laughs> you know, hello darling, yes, we are. And they extend her limit. Um, so you so, were taught how to succeed and to become an image. Yes. Okay. See, I told you I would learn something when I do this. <laughs> okay. See, yeah. and, 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 and absolutely, and that is and that is what I did. I built what she taught me to do. I built this structure that from the outside looked absolutely amazing. Um, and she never, unfortunately, got to her inside. Uh, but she was only, you know, 34 when she passed. So, um, or 35. Well, can I share one thing very quick? Yes. You made a comment that uh, those who deal with uh, domestic violence uh, get upset with you when you say we're responsible. So one of the things I had to learn 
is this thing that I call the broken mirror syndrome. If we grow up in a, ch in a childhood where the only mirrors we have are the ones from the circus, or they're broken, they're distorted, and that's all we ever see, when we go into our first own house and there's a mirror that's perfectly clean, the first thing we do is break it. And that's the only way we can survive. So once we accept that we're breaking the mirror, we then have the power to not break it. It is true. It is just taking that, that ownership of your peace, which may be minor. Um, and, and I think, I just another disclaimer, um, not calling any victims responsible for any type of abuse whatsoever. Um, in my own personal situation, I had many opportunities to leave. Many. But, but I was too broken to do that. Image. I was too broken to do that.